Welcome to the Firehouse Roundtable podcast brought to you by the Ventura Fire Foundation. My name is Peter McKenzie. I'm one of the hosts. I'm a retired fire captain with the City of Ventura Fire Department. And I'm Jason Kay. I'm an active fire captain also with the Ventura Fire Department. And we are excited that you are going to spend some time with us at the kitchen table, learning about firehouse issues that we're trying to bring awareness to. Thanks for joining us as we discuss the issues of being a firefighter, both on and off duty, and how it affects us. Let's get right to it. Today, we're going to have Hoffman's Kids. So I'm looking forward to this. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this too. Madeline and Aaron... Hoffman are with us today and they actually reached out to the foundation and said, Hey, I think it would be good for you guys to do a recording or a podcast on firefighters, kids and how that career affects us as their kids. Yeah. Which at first I was like, okay, I don't know how that's going to go, but I'm excited for it. And it actually was, it was very, very insightful. And I think that it'll be good for a lot of the families to, to listen to a lot of the firefighters that have kids to listen to for sure. But uh, everybody knows Tom and he's a great guy and I'm looking forward to to hearing from his adult children because as we were growing up in the fire department, he they were babies. They were little kids. And now, you know, we're here having an adult conversation with them. So, yeah, let's get right into it. All right, Madeline, Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is a first for us. This is the first time we've had children of firefighters on the show, and I'm I'm excited about it. But just for the sake of the firemen and our listeners who don't know who you are, because I think any fireman that's been around for a little while knows Hoffman's kids. But tell tell us who you are. Tell us who your dad is. A little bit about what you're doing and kind of where you're at today. Do you want to go first, Madeline? Yeah, I'll go first. I'm the older of the two of us. Um, so I'm Madeline Hoffman. I'm uh, Tom's middle child. I have an older brother, Lucas. Um, He's in Austria right now. So I'm currently in Kansas. I'm teaching high school math. I studied math at Benedictine College, just graduated in December. I'm just here waiting to walk in May. Um, But I grew up in Ventura all my life, and I'm going to relocate back there at the end of the school year. So I'll be there for the summer and then hopefully teaching there next year. So it's been really fun having my dad in the fire service. So I'm excited to talk to you guys today about it. Awesome. Yeah, we're excited about it too. And then Aaron, how about you? My name's Aaron. I'm Tom's youngest. Um, I'm currently in college down in Irvine at Concordia University. I'm studying biology. I'm a minor in pre-nursing, and my goal is to go to an accelerated Bachelor's of Science in Nursing program after this, um, and then be an RN for a few years, hopefully become a nurse practitioner. And yeah, we're really excited to be here. Awesome. And then can somebody give us an update on Lucas, what he's doing, where he's at kind of? He is making me so jealous. He's in Salzburg right now. He, One of his college friends lives out there with his wife, and him and his girlfriend went out there, and they, they're doing the whole Sound of Music tour, and they went to Slovenia, and they went to, uh, they might have gone to Italy for dinner just casually. Like, he's just living his life. Um, but he's teaching, when he's not in Europe, he's teaching um, middle school math and science at Midtown LA at a private school there. So In Los Angeles? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. This is cool because I think I mean Jason's been around forever and and I've heard all the stories about you guys. Not all the stories, but plenty of stories about you guys. It, it's just interesting to sit here and talk to you as adults, which um, is going to be fun. Like I think this is like I said, uncharted territory for us, and we're excited to to get into. Really, what we want to get into is like, what can you guys share that will help other kids that are living in the, in these fire families navigate some of the uniqueness that we have? And just for a little context for you guys, I have three daughters. Uh, they're, I think, a generation right under you. Like my oldest is a junior in, in high school currently. And then Jason has kids as well. So just in reading what you guys submitted before we got on the podcast was already like giving me stuff to talk about. And yeah, so I'm excited to get into it. I don't want to get all into it right here, right now, but um, thanks for introducing yourselves. And this is also awkward because I've known your dad forever and you're, you know, so it'll be, it'll be a fun conversation and hopefully he's happy. Get the other side of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully (laughs) he's happy with us when this is all over, but anyhow, Jason, how about you? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I've been looking forward to this too. I've I've been hoping that we have different firefighters kids on here to give different perspectives. Um, my kids are 
maybe just a little bit older than you guys. Um, so I know that they're excited at some point to come on too. So I'm hoping you guys could kind of timeline this thing is kind of how I see this playing out in my head. So maybe start from when the first time you knew dad's a firefighter, if that made you think that that was cool or not so cool and why. And then as you're a little kid, you know, events that he couldn't come to or if he was gone for holidays or just kind of some of your younger memories from that. Yeah, well, I can go first. I I think one of my first memories of my dad as a firefighter was when he picked me up from preschool in the engine. And I remember I put my little booster seat in the captain's seat and he let me sit there and look at the call log and click all the buttons. I just thought it was the coolest thing. And I was so proud that all my classmates were jealous and they thought that that was a cool thing, too. You know, that was definitely the more like positive end of it. But then slowly as we got older, we started to realize, okay, you know, dad's gone for two days at a time or back then it was maybe one day at a time. There's possibility he's going to be missing my birthday this year. You know, we'd get like the new uh, calendar that had an A, B and C shift on it. And we'd immediately rush to it. At least I would and be like, oh, is he working Christmas? Is he working my birthday? What days is he going to be missing? What events can he come to? Stuff like that. So we, I think... We definitely learned to plan ahead, especially as really little kids. What did, how'd that make you feel when you saw he was working on Christmas? Like, how did that go in your head, in your six, seven, eight year old mind? Like, what do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, it was definitely a bummer because it was, well, my first thought was saying we have to wake up really early to open gifts. (laughs) That was the big thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Either wake up really early and open the gifts before he left. Yeah. Or if he was coming home, then we had to like wait until he came home and whoever was relieving him, like, you know, it was always a waiting game. One year, I remember we were, I honestly, I feel like we were more bummed when he worked Christmas Eve. I know I was at least because it meant a, we'd have to wait longer. And then, um, usually he was in charge of cooking Christmas Eve dinner. So it was, you know, put on someone else. But I remember this one year, there was this guy that I, I don't know who he was, but he was set to relieve my dad on Christmas morning. And for some reason he didn't show up till like nine Ooh, I hope this wasn't you or me, Jason. <laughs> I don't think so. I think I would remember. <laughs> um, but no, he didn't show up till like nine or 10 in the morning. And I was very upset at that guy. I don't remember who he was, luckily, but. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. This is weird. See, because having kids and hearing this story is like, I, I'm, I'm like wondering what are, what were my kids thinking or what would they say if they were here? <laughs> but Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember like Aaron said with the preschool picking us up, I just remember him like coming and like demoing the engine. Um, we went to Sacred Heart as our elementary school and I remember he came and did a demonstration there as well with the big ladder and everything. I remember like going on a positive note. I loved going like to the station. I think he made that time very special for us. Um, like going and I just remember the smell of the expo markers yes. and like writing on the whiteboard. That was like the funnest thing to me. And he was at station three at the time in like our younger years, right by Boina. So we would go there. Um, and he would also make a point to call us like every single night that he was working. And it wasn't just like, okay, it's a group call. You know, how's everyone's day? Like he took time to talk to each one of us and say, okay, well, how was your school day? Oh, what'd you learn? Like, you know, if something special happened that day that he missed, let's talk about it. So he really gave us like special individual time when we were younger. And I think I really appreciated that, especially when he was like gone multiple days at a time, you know, if he got mandated or when they switched the shifts to 48. So I think he made that. And that that was probably also good for my mom as well to kind of, you know, be in contact all the time. Yeah. You guys, you guys were lucky that you lived in, in the town that he worked and you were able to, a lot of our guys live far away and they don't really have that option. FaceTime is a game changer for the kids these days. It's really cool to be able to see their parents at work. And a lot of times you'll go, I, I work at a station that's three stories and you go outside to go to your room and there's guys on the stairwell FaceTiming their kids to get their time in with their kids. Cause a phone call is what I did too. That was super cool. But nowadays where you can actually see what's going on or mom calls dad and says, look what Jimmy's doing. You got to take care of this yeah. <laughs> from the station is, is part of it too. And then the other thing you guys reminded me is when, when I worked holidays, 
we would go to the calendar too. And I was, I used to be C ships. So my kids would look at the green days and go, okay, he's working on this day. So what day are we going to celebrate Easter? Did you guys do some of that where you would change the days around and that, that did that bum you out or was that no big deal? Luckily, we have a lot of family in Ventura. That's where both of my parents' families are from, too. So we didn't really have to change, like, major holidays like that. Um, the first days, we would definitely try and celebrate. If he was missing that day, we would celebrate either the day before or the day after or two days before or two days after, depending on when he would be available. Yeah, or sometimes, like, we would bring a cake to the station. And, like, like I remember, like, for Father's Day or for his birthday, we'd bring a cake to the station, like, just sing happy birthday, like a little something for him. But yeah, both of our families are in Ventura. So we would go, it kind of flip flops. Like for Christmas, we have traditions. We go to mom's side Christmas Eve and then dad's side Christmas day. So we would still like go and be with his family. So it was, we were pretty set on that. Thanksgiving, we usually alternate every year. So when he's usually not working, we'll go to his family. Your dad has such a small family, right? What is he the youngest of like, was it 12? He's the middle of 12. He's the seventh of twelve. Seventh of twelve. Wow. So, a cu- couple things. Uh, you you brought up the expo markers, the whiteboard markers. Every kid, I don't care who they are, they go straight to that whiteboard. You're in the fire station. You got the fire truck, all the pole, all the things. They all they want's the whiteboard. Yeah, and my kids are the same way. The treadmill on the whiteboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still will. I still will. Sometimes in my classrooms, I'll have those particular like old expo markers and I'll like open it to write something on the board. I'll just take a whiff and it just takes uh, me back. It's, it's yeah. like the spell <laughs> yeah. of the expo. Marker. I got a story about your dad. I got a story about your dad. So um, I think every fireman has done their fair share of bringing the fire engine to their kid's school, right? Like uh, clearly you just mentioned he would bring it to your school. Somehow your dad got roped into bringing the fire engine to Montalvo elementary, which is where my girls go. They're in that dual immersion program or went at this point. And the second I started going there, your dad hit me up immediately. Like, Hey, uh, your kids are going to Montalvo and I have to do this every year. Cause he, I think one of his friends was a teacher. Or there was some connection there. Yeah. He immediately dumped that onto my lap. And then <laughs> I got stuck going to Montalvo every year, which was cool when my girls were there. Cause it's fun and exciting and, but not as much when they're not there. And I think I eventually, I, I eventually dumped it off onto somebody else. But uh, in hindsight, I was like, Oh yeah, I'll do that for you. That sounds great. The kids and my girls. And, and then, then it got to be a chore, but. Anyway, that's a story I remember about your dad and taking fire engines to schools and stuff. Yeah. So the next thing we can get into the next part of that timeline, if you guys are ready, and that's going to be like junior high ish to maybe your early teen years and how that changed. And, you know, there's got to be this dichotomy of wanting dad to not be around sometimes and then really needing him for support. And as you get older, you kind of realize you could have used it for some of that support and especially when it was just mom at home did you ever kind of feel like like mom was a single parent or that you needed dad around or how did you guys deal with that I think in the moment I never really saw my mom as a single parent or um really realized all the work that she put in because when you're a kid you don't really know how hard kids are to actually deal with but yeah looking back she definitely was signing up for a lot and kind of off topic, but I have a friend who has a very serious boyfriend who was going into the fire service and they like to both talk to me about um, their experiences and stuff like that. And I'm very upfront and honest in saying it's a lot to sign up for. It's a lot for your family aside from just committing to it. But yeah, I would say going into middle school and high school is when I really started to realize the impact of everything. You know, a lot of people I feel like would when they found out my dad was a firefighter, they would say like, Oh, that's so cool. Like, I'm so jealous. I wish mine was. And at times it would be like, yeah, like, you know, I'm really proud of the work he does. He helps the community. It's a cool job. I get some benefits, but you know, a lot of people weren't really realizing the psychological effects that it was having. And I feel like I, even myself wasn't fully realizing them until now that I've gotten older and, you know, gotten into therapy and been able to process everything, I can look back and be like, oh, like my childhood was a lot different from a lot of my friends. I agree with what you're saying about your mom. And, you know, as a fire wife, they 
don't realize how big of a sign up it is. And it's so cool to date a firefighter. And then all of a sudden you guys are married and now you have a kid and now you're alone a lot of the time. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Go ahead, Madeline. Yeah. I was going to say like, and, and as we were realizing that, I think my parents are very strong in that they didn't really let us see if there was an issue, which we really appreciated. Like, I mean, like Aaron said, like we never really realized um, until now, but it's like my parents are very good at making sure that their issues weren't our issues and making sure that we had the freedom to kind of do um, excel in school and in sports and in extracurriculars and, you know, make sure that we were supported in that, even if there was some, you know, difficulty with mom being the only one home. My dad still tried to make a point of, you know, when he was off attending or, um, you know, like I said, calling us about it, seeing how we were doing. But yeah, I think it was definitely difficult. And I, I can't speak for my mom how difficult it was for her, but I, I can't imagine um, there are certain we, we would have leftovers when my dad wasn't at when my dad wasn't at home and like <laughs> certain things and be like, Oh man, we're doing leftovers again, taco meat, whatever. But now I'm realizing like, that's, that's all she had time for. She's coming home from work. Like she didn't have time to make a full meal. So, um, versus my dad would be at home all day if he had a day off. So he was able to make dinner. But now, now, like Aaron said, now that we're adults, we're able to process that. And now that we're, you know, functioning and trying to figure out who we are, you know, and we're asking these questions to our parents too. So, we're being more open now, I think. Madeline, I want to get back. I, I want to get into what life was like when dad was at the station, when it was just you and mom. But before we do that, I want to circle back to Aaron. And Aaron, you, so I think we've like probably eclipsed the dad's a fireman, fire trucks are cool and shiny, and we get to climb on them phase. And we're like into this kind of sucks. Like, where's dad at? Why is mom stressed out? Why are we doing all this? Right. So, Aaron, you talked about when you became old enough to start processing, I'm assuming the negative aspects of that, if you're open to sharing what that was and like maybe how old you were and like that kind of struggle, I think that would be really helpful because there's plenty of kids now that are right where you're talking about. Yeah. I started to feel the negative impacts of it probably in middle school with him being gone, stuff like that, but probably wasn't until like high school maybe sophomore year or something like that, that I was finally able to realize what what I was feeling and where those feelings came from. Uh, but one of the things that immediately came to my mind was when I was learning how to drive, a lot of my friends, you know, when you get your provisional license, it's don't drive with anyone under 21 or whatever for a year, something like that. All my friends would break that rule or you know, not really listen to it, bend the rules a little bit. But my dad was very strict, <laughs> didn't want us to drive with the radio on for like three months after we got our license, everything like that. And the thing is that I, I listened to him because my biggest fear was that if I were to be messing around and get in an accident, my dad would show up to the scene and he would have to see me in that state. So. Once I kind of had that thought, I was like, oh my gosh, like how many of the actions that I do are because I'm worried about something because I have this fear, you know? Let me share something with you. First off, I'm currently in that battle with Emma, my <laughs> oldest, because she has a provisional license and I will not let her drive her friends around and all of her friends break that rule and their parents don't care, right? Yep. So we're in, I'm in that for sure. But what I want to talk about, and this is so interesting to me because you're expressing your side and then I already know how your dad feels, right? Just because I'm basically in the same shoes as him. And I've never had these kind of open conversations with my kids about this topic. And my guess is you probably didn't either. It's when you got older and more mature and you understood more. But as firefighters, because I, this is same in like my circle of friends who aren't in the fire service. They don't understand why I'm like, no, you're going to wear your seatbelt or no, you're going to put that helmet on. We're not going to go do whatever it is you're trying to do. That's crazy because we live in the worst case scenario. Every day you go to work, it's somebody's worst case scenario, like some tragic event where a kid has died or grandpa or something bad happens so where most normal people don't live in the worst case scenario, sure, they know if you ride a motorcycle, maybe you could get hurt, but they don't see people dying on motorcycles. Like 
This is why I don't ride motorcycles, right? But since we live there, when it's your kid, you're like, there's no way in hell I'm going to let my kid have this happen to them. And the way that I know how to stop that is I'm going to be strict. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to come down on them. I'm not going to let them do this. Not saying that that's right, because I think you could go too far on that. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that some too. But that is where your dad is coming from. It's it's this weird, messed up world that we live in. Thankfully, not anymore for me. But th- where all you do is see the worst case scenario. And you just go, this is not happening to my family. If I can prevent this, I'm going to prevent this. And the, the people who get the brunt of it are the kids. So Yeah, and I'll, I'll tag on to that and say the other thing is when you have uh, one of your kids in a small department like Ventura City, there are six places in Ventura where everybody's going to know who you are and if you're breaking one of those rules, right? And you never know when on top of those six places, and I'm talking about fire stations, there's going to be other people in the community driving around who look over and see that you have somebody in your passenger seat all of a sudden. So you also have all kinds of extra monitors around too, which is for better and for worse in this day and age. Yeah. Well, yeah, even when my dad was at work, we would see him, you know, if I was driving. Uh, well, when we were older, he was down at Station 2 when we were, like, in high school. We went to St. Bonaventure, so it was down in that area. Um, but there would be times where I would be driving, you know, back home or going somewhere after school, and I would see him in the engine. So it was, you know, it was partially to cover my own butt of, oh, God, he could see me. But connecting to what you were saying, Pete, it's like he had those rules for me because he saw the negative impacts it could have on me. But then I had those rules for myself because I was worried about the negative impact it could have on him. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I can't wait to share this episode with my girls. (laughs) (laughs) See, dad, see. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, um, Madeline, let's circle back to you alluded to the difference when dad's home and when dad's gone, like what does home life look like when he's there versus when he's not there? And because this, I had my own like epiphany when I left the fire department, this was kind of a struggle for me because there was clear differences at home when I was home, when I wasn't, the problem is I wasn't there when they were running the show without me. And now all of a sudden I was there, which I was like, what's going on here? Like, how does this work? So Interested in your perspective and Aaron's perspective on what life was like without dad and what life was like with dad at home. I say first thing, and Aaron will agree with this, when dad comes home from the station, you do not talk to him until you are acknowledged. Mm-hmm. He He's in that mindset. He just, like you said, he just came off from a difficult shift. He's probably seen some stuff, like depending on how long it's been, he hasn't been at home. He goes to the couch or his bed, he takes a nap and you just don't like he's, he's a grumpy guy when he doesn't sleep. So you just don't talk to him until he acknowledges you and he's ready. Um, My dad's also a busybody, So even when he is at home, he loves to go in the garage and, you know, do woodworking. He builds Adirondack chairs and he's helped me build a photo frame for my friend before. I don't know what he's building right now. He builds random like little tables and beer (laughs) openers and that sort of thing, but he's definitely a busybody, And I've, I've noticed that more now versus when we were younger. I think because when we were younger, we were at school most of the time. Like he would come home in the morning and like go to bed. Um, And we were at school or we had an activity to go to. We had soccer games or whatever. But now he's just, he's constantly, he's always doing something. And so I think that definitely reflected on us now. Like we feel like we always have to be doing something. Um, And sometimes it's kind of hard because now I feel guilty if I'm like taking a day for myself. But I think now um, we've become more introspective with that and like having open conversations with him now um, and saying, you know, it's okay to step back and take a day for yourself. But back then it was like, you have to be doing something, you have to be doing a chore, let's mow the lawn, let's sweep the the floors, let's clean the kitchen. Like, let's like, you have to do something. And it was always like, you have to do this before mom gets home, do this for mom before she gets home. It'll be nice for her. So even when he was home, he was always caring for his wife. When he wasn't home, it was, I mean, if we were at school, then my mom would drop us off like super early because she worked far away. So she would drop us off super early. We'd go to daycare, um, like in middle school. And then we'd go throughout our day and then she'd pick us up whenever she gets off or grandma would pick us up or whatever and take us home. And we always had like soccer or something to distract us. Um, 
And yeah, she would make, like I said, leftover dinners. And so, and then we'd have our phone call with my dad and then pretty much go to bed. I think it kind of was hard because when you don't have both parents at home, it's like, it's very one-sided or it can feel one-sided as a kid. So I know that I personally had some issues with my mom. I felt like she wasn't listening to my side of things. And, you know, Aaron always got her way. Lucas was doing this. Like, why is everything so hard on me? Blah, blah, blah. And it caused a lot of tension between me and my mom. And now that I'm older, I understand she was just doing the best that she could. And I wish I could take that time back of being a little bit kinder to her. And so younger kids that are listening to this, be kind to your moms at home because they're doing the best that they can. So I, I, I'd say it caused a bit of tension. But now, um, especially when I had like more independence with my license and I could leave and, you know, do things on my own, hang out with my friends, it got a little bit better. And now like that I'm an adult, I definitely understand more. But at that time it was like, why is mom being so hard? And why do we have to follow the rules? And oh, it's dad's rules, like blah, 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 all those things. It's such a positive and a negative when you have the, the one-sidedness that you're talking about. Like it feels one-sided also because you don't have two parents in agreement talking to you or, you know, talking behind closed doors, maybe, and deciding what the best is, even though they disagree. But now it's literally just a one on one kid versus parent conversation. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Um, Yeah, a lot of the stuff you're saying is like, Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, we got to revisit that again. The other thing you're talking about is the positives versus negatives, like it's great to be a firefighter and have 24 plus hours off at a time, you get to go to your kids school events and be with them the whole day. And versus, you know, somebody who comes home at six o'clock, but is home every night, just a different lifestyle. Madeline, quick question for you. When dad was at the station, was it, did, was there still the pressure to always be doing something? Dad would want us to be doing this, doing that, or was it way more relaxed? <laughs> like an Aaron nodding. <laughs> oh, I definitely, I definitely had that. I definitely had that guilt of like, oh, I'm not doing something. I need to be doing something. Why am I not doing homework or a chore? Or why am I not making dinner or like something doing the dishes? Like whatever. I, I still had, and I still have that instilled in me. I think he definitely, he just, he demanded respect and we respect him so much. And so we honored his rules, even if he were, if he wasn't there. Okay. Aaron, what was your per perspective? Cause I, it, maybe it's the same, maybe it's different. Well, one thing I want to touch on the very last thing Madeline said, I, you know, especially meeting new friends and, you know, being at school and meeting people from way different backgrounds for me, I've realized how much we've grown up in a household of respect um, how much I respect my parents. I'm very open with them. I tell them everything that's going on in my life, the good, the bad. So for me, you know, secrets and hiding things, sneaking things don't, that doesn't really relate to what, you know, we like to do or who we are as people who are very open with our parents. But yeah, I would say with my dad being away, especially as a little kid, I felt really disconnected from him. And I was definitely way more attached to my mom, um, especially because when we were really little, she like worked part time, I believe. So she only went to work like one or two days a week. And I was definitely yeah, way more attached to her. And when my dad would come on, I remember I would feel like not like uncomfortable, but I think I was a little scared because when he would come home, we would call it captain mode. He would come home in that captain mode where he like Madeline said, it was, you know, why are you not sweeping the floors? Can't you see they're so dirty or whose dish is in the sink or who washed that last night? This wasn't washed wrong. That was the big thing. <laughs> so yeah, I was kind of scared of him as a little kid. And then slowly I started to realize more of, okay, well, uh, if he's coming home at 8 a.m., I'm going to get up at seven and watch my hour of cartoons. But when he's coming home at eight, I'm going to look busy. I'm you know, gonna go in the backyard and work out, or I'm gonna go for a walk or do these chores or whatever. It would make yourself look busy. And then when it comes to maybe 10 o'clock, he's more settled, then I can get back to relaxing on the weekend or something like that. Gosh, this is like, like being punched in the face a little bit. So when you wrote on your form that captain mode, two things. One, I know what your dad's captain mode is like because I used to work for him for a while, right? I don't remember how long, but I, I, and it's not just me. I think everybody knows what your dad's captain mode is. And this is not a dig at, at Tom at all, like not even a little bit. The reality is there's a lot of people who are just like him, right? Maybe, I mean, I, no one's identical, but like 
maybe four or five years ago, we had Dr. O's come in and give a seminar and to all the spouses on like how to cope with, you know, exactly what we're talking about. And my wife, Miranda came home and she, and she was telling me like, oh yeah, there's two types of fire husband people. You have the Disneyland dad and you have the fun killer. (laughs) The difference between the two, and I'll probably botch this, but the point it'll make sense is when the Disneyland dad comes home from the fire station, it's party time. We're going to just do everything fun. We're going to not care about chores or any of this nonsense. The only thing that matters is we're going to go have a good time. That's one person. And then the fun killer is your dad and myself uh, who comes home and is like, why aren't these dishes done? Why is this dirty? Why are you guys not doing anything? And I can relate to that because that's me. And I didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to be the Disneyland dad, but it is what it is. But so there's that. And it sucks being that person. Right. And I've like had after like hearing that from my wife and all that, like I still to this day try to be less like that. But when you're sleep deprived and you're grumpy and you've been up all night and you come home, it's like the natural reaction. And clearly you guys live through that. And I'm assuming your dad was a fun killer like me and not the Disneyland dad. And it's no fault of his own. It's just kind of what you default to. But yeah. And it's specifically when you're talking about dishes and your dad, because he's very specific on the dishes <laughs> and the water use. And yeah, like, I, I remember having like, I remember having like a thing at station two about the dishes. And I like, didn't know if he was being serious, but he was being serious and it got kind of weird. But Funny story with your dad. Hopefully we can laugh about that one later. But I I was the fun killer, I guess you could call it as well, where you come in and you go, why did why did this stuff get let go while I was gone? And now I'm home and I got to take care of all this extra stuff. And there's a pile and I've just been at work for two or three days in a row. Um, but what you said before, I think it was Madeline that said, maybe both you guys said it, dad has to acknowledge you first. And then you guys can have a conversation with dad. People have heard me say on the podcast before, my first day off, I don't make any big decisions. I know I'm sleep deprived and I know I'm about half there at best. So that's my rule for myself. Did you guys come up with that rule on your own or was that a family rule? Or did did you guys as kids talk about it? Or how did you guys decide, hey, don't go talk to dad or it was, was a trial by fire experience. Don't go talk to dad until he acknowledges you first. I'd say a mix. It's it's it was pretty much like a kid and stated rule. Like it was kind of like an unspoken. Aaron Lucas and I like okay, dad's home, and we've definitely made the mistake before of, of talking to him like while he's <laughs> mid nap, mid nap. You know, it's something like if something comes up and you're like, oh, and he's like, why are you talking? Well, to me? <laughs> I was yeah. We've also seen like if I have not been the one to you know make the mistake, I've seen him or I've seen Madeline or Lucas get chewed out by my dad that first like. I will say, though, I do want to give credit to my dad. I feel like, although, yes, he was the fun killer when he first came home, once he got his, like, 2 p.m. nap, he, especially that first day when we were little, he became the Disneyland dad. Mm -hmm. And I remember a few times when he would pick us up from elementary school and on the way home was a Circle K. So on a hot day, he'd take us in there and he'd let us get a slurpee. And it was like, oh, my God, my mom would never let us do this. It's so cool. <laughs> mom would never let <laughs> so us do that. So our mom's a dietitian. So there were days where it was like, oh, like, we'll take you to go get ice cream or stuff like that. So he had his moments where he, I, you can tell he probably felt guilty. He was trying to make it up to us. But, yeah, if, if he had not had his nap, tread lightly. Yeah. Like li- like literally walk lightly around the house. <laughs> Your dad is actually good at naps, and I'm jealous of him for being able to fall asleep quickly. Oh, gosh. Um, and, yeah. and at the same time, I will say um, your dad is um, – he really puts his family first is what I'm trying to say. So everything he did for you guys as his kids and his wife was always out of the best intention. And I remember him building – all kinds of toys for you guys at work. And, you know, remember the the tractor that him and Lucas used to mess with together and all that stuff. He did everything to be a great dad. And I can say from experience that sometimes we get that wrong. And sometimes we have no control over the sleep pattern and, you know, what's going on inside of our heads. But it's always and I know that he's a he's huge on respect. I know that um, Tom Hoffman's favorite saying 
You guys know what I'm going to say? <laughs> oh, yeah. Three things I hold dear. My pizza needs to taste like pizza. My coffee needs to taste like coffee. And my Van Halen needs to sound like Van Halen because I do not recognize Van Hagar. Those are those are my favorite Hoffmanisms. No, no Van Hagar in this house. <laughs> <laughs> those stand true. That, yeah, that, that's his <laughs> mantra. It's like the, it was like the funniest thing growing up. Huh? Hey, this is Joe Booth from the Ventura Fire Foundation. To learn more about the foundation and our programs, visit our website at www.venturafirefoundation.org. 100% of our funding comes from generous donors. If you like what we're doing, I encourage you to become a donor. It's very easy. Just go to our website. Again, that's venturafirefoundation.org and click the red donate button at the top. Whether it's $5 or $5,000, every donation helps ensure local firefighters thrive. When did you start understanding him better in regards to this stuff? Kind of like late high school and even now that I'm gone, um, which kind of sounds counterintuitive because I'm away. But I think in high school, like once I got my license, I had that freedom to like, I would love to go when he worked at station two, I'd pull up and then we walk across the parking lot to Valentino's and get a half sandwich, half salad lunch deal and go have lunch at the station just like after school or if I had like the day off of work on a Saturday. I I really enjoyed spending time with him then and kind of that kind of is when I kind of understood because I could go on calls with him too. That was really fun. A couple interesting ones. And I think now that I'm away because now that he doesn't see me whenever he goes home and I don't see him. It's definitely more special when I get to talk to him like on the phone. And we've definitely become more open about certain things like with mental health stuff that we've both kind of gone through. We've been able to kind of talk and build a rapport about that. And I've definitely seen like his more caring side. I think when I've been gone, because I've, I've gone through a lot of issues being far away from home and I've definitely seen him kind of unlock that more empathetic side. Um, but he's definitely still, you know, holds, you know, he, he wants me to do my best. And so sometimes I could take it as harsh. Uh, that's just who I am. But I think he definitely, I, I've definitely seen him more as like a caring, kind individual as of lately. To go off of that, I know that we always like to joke, mostly as kids, but sometimes my mom and even my dad has gone in on it, that when we're in trouble, he's a big lecturer. Um, and it's <laughs> when, when you were the one in trouble, it was like, oh God, like I know, I know, like, you know, whatever. But when I, especially as I've been able to go on a few like ride alongs and stuff like that and experienced the world that you guys are living in, it really kind of hits like how much an explanation can help change someone's behavior. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes a lecture is still not the best thing if you're in a heated argument. And I think he's done a good job of mapping that out once we've communicated it. But, you know, some of the problems that you guys come across, it's like, oh, my gosh, like this just needs a little talking through. And then, you know, the behavior needs to change. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's a really weird dynamic. But um, yeah, and especially as I myself had gotten older and gotten into therapy, which I started like my freshman year of high school, just for general anxieties and stuff like that. I've been able to realize the root of a lot of my problems and see them in him aside from his job, just in his, you know, family life, his siblings, some of them struggle from anxiety and depression and stuff like that. So I see how a lot of that runs in the family and how that affects who he is when he comes home. And I know that I'm the same when I'm feeling irritated or something like that. I have a short fuse as well. So I'm able to sympathize a little bit better. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And I also I'd love to get into a little bit more about that specifically when it comes to you talked about therapy and realizing where some of your anxiety. And then earlier you talked about um, understanding why dad feels the way he does after work. Was there anything specifically from your sessions in therapy that you feel like was just an eye opener or a game changer where you go, Oh, 
because dad's a firefighter, he had to be this way? Or was it more um, just generalizations like dad is this way and he's also a firefighter. So this is kind of where I'm coming from and what to expect. Yeah, there was definitely both there. I had always kind of known um, a lot of the behaviors that came from him being a firefighter, being very protective, thinking through a lot of actions. There were a lot of things that maybe we would get in trouble for that other kids wouldn't like, you know, having candles or putting your pizza box on the stove, like those you, you would get a little of a, you know, a talking to when other people wouldn't. But also I remember this one specific therapy session where I had my mom with me and we were kind of talking about my dad that just came up and she was able to share uh, a little bit more about his childhood that I didn't know. And a lot of it, I think, does come from his family life. You know, he grew up with 11 siblings. Um, my grandpa was the only one that worked. And my grandpa was a very, like, quiet. I don't know if any of you guys met him, but he was very quiet. I've met him. Yeah, I've met him. Yeah, very Ron Swanson kind of <laughs> guy. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> so I feel like regardless of his career, he would be ritualistic and by the book and stuff like that but especially because he is a firefighter like it's been heightened almost yeah it brings it out for sure i I can relate to so much of what you guys are talking about and the overprotectiveness and all my kids know don't you dare have a candle and if you do never i mean that's like you know you might as well go to hell if you're gonna have a candle in the house If, if you do you better make sure they're out I remember the first candle I bought, I was like, oh, should I be doing this? Like I have, like I live in my own house. Like I have roommates that I, you know, live in a separate house. And I'm like, am I allowed to? Like, it was like, still, <laughs> I still don't do it. That's weird. I, I, I never had a thing with candles, but I guess that's a thing. Oh huh? yeah. Anyway. You know, um, my, my dad's line was always, you know how many houses I've seen burned down because the teenage daughter forgot to blow out her candle at night. Like how many? Yeah. How many? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Madeline, I, I want to say something. So it was telling to me, and I'm like going through my own therapy, just hearing you guys talk about this stuff. So um, when you said your relationship with your dad changed when you left and you were away at college, and then all of a sudden you started to see his more caring, empathetic side, it like started my mind thinking like, okay, like, w- why is that? Like, what is, you know, what's behind that? And I think, I, I mean, I don't, obviously don't really know because your dad's not here to tell us what's behind that, but you're very mission oriented as a firefighter. And I, I do, and your dad clearly does, and Jason does. Like, I take my obligation as a father, like, extremely serious, serious and I am going to do the best job that I can. And when you take him from his fire department time, like when he's there and it's all very mission oriented, very hierarchical and everyone has a job and everyone's going to do it. And then you blend in his personality, which is unique to him. Then you bring him home and he's like, I'm not really, uh, I still have an obligation to raise my kids a certain way and provide for them a certain way. And I think once you left, maybe that some of that, like, okay, I did it. I succeeded. Madeline's an adult and she's gone. Maybe that like flipped the switch and it's like, okay, now I, you know, we're different. Maybe we're more at the same level versus I have a job yeah. to do when she's a little girl. I don't know. I'm just, does, does that resonate? No, Did that yeah. feel that way or? Yeah. And I've, I've actually, when you said like the whole thing about like all the kids leaving, I've had that conversation with him because we've both, my dad and I have both gone through similar like mental health issues. I don't know how much he's talked about it and I don't want to talk about it on behalf of him. Sure. Um, but I've, I've gone through, um, I've gone through like, I've, I've had a lot of issues with depression and with anxiety and stuff. And it got really bad last semester. And my dad was open with me and said, like, he said that same thing. He's like, well, when you went off to college, I didn't have to come home and like, you know, raise you anymore. It's like, I, I set you off and it, it kind of put him in a slump a little bit too. And so I was kind of able to relate to that and, you know, reassure him that like, you know, I, I'm successful and I'm holding my own. I have a job, but he still has those expectations for me. And so I think, yeah, just being like far away and being kind of an adult, kind of being on the same level, I can have a drink with him now. Like that's weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, I think we've definitely had that like mutual respect and we're able to kind of communicate and he's definitely become better. Like we text each other every day, at least like through our wordle, 
like we wordle every day and send each other our results. So I talk to him every day, but yeah, we've definitely had a lot of good conversations about that. And it's been enlightening for me and it's kind of helped me like through my own mental health journey as well. Yeah, that's awesome that I, I look forward to th- that type of change in relationship with my girls. They're all still relatively young right now. But um, and I do want to give mad props to your mom and your dad because they did a great job with you guys. Like you guys, I mean, from having three kids and like worrying about are they going to launch? Are they going to go to school? Are they going to work? Are they going to stay off drugs? Are they going to do all these potential landmines? Your parents did it like you guys all. Well, Aaron, you're still in school, but you guys all, you know, stayed alive. You all went to college. You're all probably going to be working like they launched you guys well. And I that's a lot of respect to your parents for that. So. And I'll follow up to that saying it, that's on you guys. You guys did a great job listening to them. And absolutely, you guys make your own journey in your own way. They gave you great advice and, and uh, a sound place from which to launch. I, When you said it's weird having a drink with your kid, man, it is weird having a drink with your kid. I'm sure it's weird <laughs> for you guys on the other side yeah. too. But when I take my kid out, we go to the brewery every once in a while. And it's like, this is okay, right? You're over... You are 23, right? Okay, we're good. But (laughs) that's actually super fun. And then the other part of that is when your kids are older, you realize it's on them now. Like I did what I could do for them. Now you make your own choices and you get to mess up on your own too. And there's only so much you can do, you know, as your kids get older as a parent. I think that's kind of a, a relief in some aspects too. So your dad can look at you guys and go, well... I did all I could do. I messed you up and I made you better. And somewhere in the middle, I hope you turn out okay and you enjoy your life. I got a question for both of you. Knowing what you know now and and going through the experiences you went through growing up in the in the way that you grew up, what would you tell someone that's just beginning to understand that their life is not like other people's lives, i.e. a kid in a fire family, you know, what do you wish you would have known back then that you know now that maybe we can do some good for kids younger than you? I think patience. Patience is huge. Like, like we said, we didn't really understand. And that's where like the root of all of my anger would come from. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't patient. I didn't want to listen to the rules. Why is it one-sided with my mom? And why is it whenever dad comes home, I'm being harped on to do all these chores and stuff. It's my day off. Like, I think just being patient and understand that they're just trying to do the best that they can with the time that they have with us and, and, you know, balance their relationship as well as, you know, our family dynamic. So I think being patient, um, that's definitely something that I have to work on, especially now being a teacher, um, it's definitely something that I've developed as well as like flexibility. Things change. Um, that's something that my dad really tries to help me to understand because I'm not. I'm a very rigid, very structured, scheduled person. But I think just being able to to stay flexible and, you know, have have fun, like when you have those moments, like really soak them in. Yeah, I I'd have to agree. And my biggest thing, don't take things personally. When he comes home and he's saying, who washed this dish? Well, it sounds like an attack on my dishwashing skills. It's not. It's more just he's just a little bit frustrated and he has a way that he likes things and um, might be a little bit disappointed that they're not maintained when he's not there. Whatever it is, it's not personal. It's not about you. And then another big thing for me was rationalizing my worries. And it's interesting because I'm I'm in a very interesting course right now. It's called History and Philosophy of Science. And we are discussing a lot of the behind the curtain things that have like happened in science. And one of them is being rational, making rational decisions and what is rational and what isn't. Being in this course is going to help me look through my own definition of rationality and really pick apart what is important for me to worry about and what's not like maybe it is a fear in my head that when my dad goes to work, he might not ever come home, but I can't live in that fear. I can't think about that every single time he goes to work or I'm going to drive myself crazy. I have to have trust in his knowledge and his skill, which I do. That's actually one thing I don't think we covered was, did you guys have a bunch of fear when your dad went to work that he would get injured or killed or was that like a, a recurring theme when you guys were growing up or is it now or where are you guys at with that just from the danger of the job? 
Yeah, I'd say for me, it's more now. Like as a little kid, I, I didn't really know. He would only tell me when I would call him every night, I would ask him all, all about all of his calls that he saw. And it was mostly like sick people, stuff like that, homeless people that I heard. But now I think I've developed more of a fear of something that he could go through. And then I also remember like every year around the anniversary of 9-11, that's obviously a really hard time for pretty much everyone in the country, but especially when I would see those scenes on the TV of the firefighters rushing into the building, my, my sadness wasn't like that could happen to him. My sadness was that would happen to him because he would be the first one to go in the building. You know, I know the guy he is. I know he's very valiant. He's very, you know, head on. He'll, he'll, he, he does what he has to do. He does what he signed up to do. So it's just kind of scary the situations he could be put in in that scenario. I know he's really smart, but you never know with those kinds of things. Yeah, I think for me, it's like a balance of anxiety and, and a lot of respect. Like, yes, there is that anxiety, especially when there's like when the Thomas fire happened and, you know, he's gone for a long period of time. You don't know when he's coming back. You know, there, there is that anxiety, but it's, I have so much respect for the amount of knowledge that that man has. If you guys have ever watched Jeopardy with him, you would know he is just like <laughs> a handful of knowledge. And I, I, I am fully confident that he would be able to, you know, do, do the best that he can and the most that he can. So it, it, it's a delicate balance between the two. I would say I have more respect and less anxiety about it because I, I know how, how confident and how competent he is. One of the things Aaron said that I wanted to hit on is you're talking about, you know, what is now really important to you. And I think that's really the basis of what makes your graduation for being a child to being an adult on your own. You know, you have this stuff that your dad and your mom also instilled into you that you always held with the utmost respect. And now that you're making your own decisions, you know, that's that's the gist of life is what is it that's valuable and important to you? that you're going to decide. And I'm sure a lot of that stuff will be the same stuff that was important to dad, but you get to choose it for yourself now. Yeah. It's, it's a really weird thing being away at school and like not, it's almost like, like I'm afraid of my own guilt. Like I would never get a candle for my dorm room or anything <laughs> like that. My roommate got one and I was like, look, it can look pretty, but I would really be uncomfortable if it was lit. Sorry. <laughs> But it's one of those where it's like, I I couldn't get the candle for my own guilt. I would just feel so like, what what would dad say if he was here kind of thing. But that's also me. I'm, I respect him a lot. So I never want to go against what he says, especially if, like you said, everything he did was for our benefit. So these rules were for our benefit. But I mean, there are some other things I'm sure that I've been a little bit more lax on. Well, in his head, right? They were for your benefit. Now you guys get to choose. And by That's the true. way, the the Glade and the Sensi, I think firefighters are keeping those things in business because you don't have to have an open flame, oh, yeah. but your house can still smell good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Scent diffusers yeah. are. Yeah. For sure. That's what I go. use. I can attest to how incredibly funny your dad <laughs> is. I don't know if you guys oh would get gosh. that at home. But he's no, like he's the, the wittiest, funniest. yeah. And the stuff he comes up with is like, like he probably is. He is cool. Yes. He's in the wrong profession. Let's let's be honest. He's in the wrong profession. <laughs> yeah. He should be a comedian. I remember a story about um, uh, Liz, his wife, your guy's mom, and he goes, "Yeah, Liz looked at me last night, and she said, do you have an off switch anywhere?'" Because he's just always on. He's always <laughs> funny. He's always witty. Yeah, he's he's not one that's just going to sit yeah. back and not engage. But yeah, no, he's the funniest funniest guy I know. The flip side is that's also probably what's caused a lot of the struggle for you guys is the fact that he won't switch it off and he will never not engage, right? And I I have unfortunately some of that in myself as well. But it's good to like have these conversations and hopefully and guess what y your dad's not unique, right? Like a lot of firemen are very similar in those traits. Um, but hopefully someone listening can have some self-awareness and go, okay, well, maybe the kids aren't into that. <laughs> maybe I should take it a little bit easier on them. It still made you who you guys are. And and it wasn't like he was doing anything wrong, but we can always improve. I'm, I'm taking what you guys are saying and like putting it in my own 
life with my kid, my girls, right? Because they're they have the same. I, I, I'm I would say identical struggles to you guys in a lot of these issues. So f- just for my own benefit, it's it's going to help, and hopefully it, it helps other families as well. So anything else you'd guys like to share before we wrap this up? Or I could tell you about the most memorable call I've been on with my dad. Do it. Well, we we went and got lunch at Valentino's. We came back to the station and we were eating and then the, the alarm went off and he's like, okay, I just put on this, this jacket, just sit in the back. And, you know, he's the captain. So he sits in the front and he's like, you know, handling out the, the address and everything what the call is about. And the, the, the best part is when he like, he turned around. I was like, where are we going? Normally it's like a lift and assist, like something happened, whatever. Homeless persons being weird, but he turns around like very slowly and he looks at me, he's like, have you ever seen a dead body before? <laughs> and I was like, where are you taking me, sir? And we show up and it's like this, they had to do CPR on this like bedridden woman. Um, she, she didn't make it. She was, she was pretty, pretty gone. But yeah, I just remember that moment of like, have you ever seen a dead body before? I was like, oh my goodness, where am I going? This is not the normal. So that, that was memorable. I just stand outside. It did not smell good. At all. <laughs> well, another thing I think it's funny how, Obviously, he asked if she had seen a dead body, but back at home, part of his humor, whenever potatoes would go bad, he'd walk up to some baggy go, like, you ever want to know what a dead body smells like? Just smell rotten potatoes. And then go throw them away. <laughs> that, <laughs> like, you know what, what people okay. are, our listeners who don't know, our listeners who don't know Tom, I could see perfectly his face while he's telling you that. Like the total seriousness yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then just the turn and just walk away. But Yeah. <laughs> It's hard. To, it's hard for people who don't know him to laugh at that. But yeah, it's like okay. Yeah, it sounds. Yeah, it sounds weird. It's not. What was that like when you saw that dead body? For was that the first time? I assume. Yeah, it's the first time I had really seen like a dead body in the wild. You know, I it was it was interesting. It was just this like bedridden woman. She was on the ground, and I just remember. I don't know how HIPAA works, but she had like had this like crunch in her neck. And when they when they were doing CPR on her, like it, all of a sudden it just snapped, <laughs> her head rolled on the ground, and it was oh, it was like the craziest thing I've ever seen. But that's when I had to go outside. Yeah, that was probably a good move. I know if, towards the towards the end of my career, I, if I didn't have to see a dead body, I would choose not to. Like I have yeah. zero interest in seeing dead bodies. Cause it's not normal. Like mo- you shouldn't no. be, you know, we shouldn't be, be, be looking at that on a regular basis. But the flip side is firefighters, nurses, they do it. I don't want to say all the time, but a lot. And it does take a toll. And that's a big part of the foundation thing is like to bring awareness to some of these issues that come up when you see stuff like that over and over and over again, over 30 years, you're not going to be the same. You're going to have, it's going to affect you, but uh, I was yeah. just interesting in your perspective because that was the first time and hopefully the only time. So. Yeah. And it was, I think the most interesting, like the best part of the call was seeing my dad doing what he's doing, like seeing my dad on the job. I think like that was like the coolest part. Like I have tremendous respect for, you know, how, like, even though like I was freaked out of my mind, I was like, Oh, a dead body. And then um, he's just keeping it cool. He's collecting information. He's asking questions. He's working with the social workers and, you know, everyone on, on standby. And like, it, it was just, it was just. Yeah. Your your dad is incredibly competent on scene of emergencies. It's it's when yeah. we get around the, the kitchen sink and the dishes yeah. that it goes a sideways. <laughs> that was a joke. That, that, was, ahead, that was a joke. Yeah. Aaron, you had your hand up. To kind of add to that, I remember I have this one specific memory where he was off duty and I think Madeline was in the car uh, with us and he was taking me to soccer practice. And we were at the intersection of Telephone and Pettit up right at the top of our neighborhood. And this man uh, was trying to bike, you know, going down Pettit across Telephone. And he got hit by a car right in front of us. And I was probably no older than like 10 at the time. So he pulls off right in front of the bus stop and immediately gets out. And I guess his role, I did not look, I was terrified, but his role was, you know, he was stabilizing the guy's neck, giving orders to everybody around. You're calling 911, you're doing this, whatever. And I'll never forget the ambulance parked right up next to our car. 
And right when I thought the coast was clear, I looked out my window and I just saw his bloody body being gurneyed up into the ambulance. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, I almost threw up. I almost passed out. And then he gets in the car and I was like, okay, you ready to go? And I was yeah, like, that sounds right. Ready to go like, soccer? <laughs> he turned around and I was like, you had like his blood on your hands. And he was like, no, I had a towel. And then he turned around and he was like reaching out to me. <laughs> telling me he's going to touch me. And I was like, no, that was, I mean, yeah, I have, I have, I have something that's related and I hate to keep talking, but I love to go talk. for it. Go for it. Um, <laughs> another thing that, that happened kind of, I was on my way to an orthodontist appointment one time and I don't know. Oh, what street is it? It's North bank, right? Where like right before you hit Johnson, if you're traveling west on North Bank, I think that's the direction. It, it kind of like curves. It makes like an S right before you get to the intersection. And we were going and he, he's, so, he's so aware that he saw this car. There was, there was a truck, like a, like, a, like a U-Haul truck kind of size, driving like next to us. And he saw this car coming towards us, like about to enter the S. And he saw that it wasn't like it wasn't turning and he like pulled over cause he knew we were going to get hit. And so he pulled over, the truck got hit, slammed on its side. And then obviously he immediately got out and started helping. And the funniest part was I'm sitting in the passenger seat of my mom's Prius and I'm just waiting. I have so much anxiety. I'm like, what's going on? And he tries calling 911, but his <laughs> Bluetooth is on in the car. <laughs> And so I'm sitting in the car and all of a sudden I see like 911, what's your emergency? And I'm like, do I say something? Do I? And it was like, he called like four times, like and he, before he realized that like the Bluetooth was connected to the car. <laughs> so finally, like he called four times and I'm just sitting in the car like, do I say something? Like he keeps hanging up and then he finally got a hold of him and, and everything was fine. But it was just like, I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? We should do a few of these episodes, Pete, and then we should have all the all the firefighter kids that we've had on and just do a story one. Because I would love yeah, to hear that good. perspective. Yeah. From all of them. Those are cool. <laughs> Guys, this was awesome. I really appreciate you coming on and being so open and transparent. And some of these issues were tough, but I think that there's going to be some benefit to other kids that are going, you know, living in the same type of life that you guys lived. Uh, Because it is unique. It's not normal to have your parent gone 50% of the time or not be able to talk to them when they're grumpy and haven't slept. Like, those are all things that it's good to bring awareness to, and we can help reduce some friction in another family, then this was all worth it. So definitely applaud you guys coming on and and sharing. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that was a cool conversation. I think that went longer than either of us thought it would go and super interesting. They kept talking about their dad and I kept hearing basically every firefighter they have that classic type a who is who becomes a firefighter and it's not really a tom thing they were talking about i pictured myself in so many of the things that they they said was just like just like their dad that's funny you say that because i was putting myself in the same (laughs) scenarios that they were talking about and um because it's true like our our there's a stereotype personality. Obviously not everybody's the same, but like I could have easily been doing the things that they were saying Tom was doing, uh, which was incredibly like insightful and eye opening. Like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I, I, that's good information to know. Right. Cause I think we wouldn't do some of the things we just do because you're sleep deprived and grumpy or whatever. But I think it was, it was good conversation and, mad props to to Aaron and Madeline for being open about it and sharing and whatnot. Isn't it great to know that we're all fun killer dad? That's such a fun thing. But I will say uh, something that I think both of them said towards the end, I wrote down on my note sheet, um, flexibility, patience, and don't take things personally. I think that's key for probably every human, every human, but especially that, you know, the firefighter kids and even you know, the firefighters themselves. And the other thing I have written down is, man, I have a lot of Tom tendencies. So just like we said, we see ourselves in that too. It was really hard for me to like process the whole fun killer thing back when, when Miranda went to that, and Steph was there, I think when they went yep. to that seminar and I was like, no, I'm not the fun killer. I'm the Disneyland dad. And Miranda was like, mm, not, not really. I go, okay. It took me a while to like get, get used to that. But anyhow. 
yeah, Steph proved that to me too when I came home and I was like, oh no, I'm the fun one. Well, let's see how you're actually not. <laughs> hey, this is called, you know, progress, self-awareness. Yes. And, and for the record, I do believe that I was asking Miranda, like, there's problems with the Disneyland dad too, right? That's not like <laughs> the preferred way to be. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> Because then you have the whole, like, well, you don't care about anything that is important here. Like, we got a schedule. We got stuff to do. And you're just out running around, you know, at Disneyland all the time. So maybe that makes you feel better. I don't know. (laughs) Anyway. All right. Let's get out of here. Thanks, Jason. All right. Take care.